Thank you. Hello, science enthusiasts. My name is Jason Zakowski, aka Dad Guy. I'm the dog dad and something kind of dad of Ginger and Bunsen and Beaker, the science dogs on social media. My co host is uh, Chris Zakowski, also known as Mummy Fabe and um, wannabe scientist. <laughs> okay. Um, every week we bring you experts um, to enthrall you with their area of knowledge. And this week, even though we've had some tech glitches, we have. Neil Kaplan Kelly um, on Clubhouse. Neil, welcome. How are you doing? Good, thanks. How are you all? Thank uh, you for your patience. Yeah, no problem. So, Chris, you'll just have to be my eyes in the skies with Neil's volume. I think it's coming through pretty clear, but I've got headphones on. So, um, oh yes, and are you? Yes, I'm hard of hearing, so I will let you know. Okay. All right. So, so, so Neil, welcome. Um, I'm so sorry you had some technical difficulties coming, but you know what? It's a good thing that we do this multicasting because you can join from the other network network when this one fails. Oh, definitely. And, you know, as I said to you, as we were getting started for somebody who studies peace, I'm now in deep conflict with my phone and technology. So I will, I will have to work through that, uh, later. <laughs> So if you're joining us on Twitter Spaces and wondering what the heck is going on, Neil is on Clubhouse and he is talking through the link I have to Clubhouse through my profile picture. So you can't see Neil's profile picture, but Neil is here. Um, so just just a little bit about yourself, Neil. You are an anthropologist and you're working on your dissertation. Could you tell everybody a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. So I am a, a PhD candidate at the University of California, Irvine, um, where I'm currently based. Uh, but I so I'm an I'm an anthropologist, uh, sociocultural and then uh, within the sociocultural realm, uh, legal and political. Uh, before I started uh, the PhD, I uh, did my undergrad in Chicago. I grew up in upstate New York. Uh, and then I was really lucky before I started the PhD to, um, on a Fulbright scholarship, work in Northern Ireland, uh, which is where I got uh, a lot of my uh, context for my, my dissertation to begin. Neil, when you were young, what got you into anthropology? Like the, this is a, anybody that gets through undergrad and then grad school and then is working on their dissertation for a PhD – that's you have to go all in on the thing you're studying. Like what got you into that yes. when you were young? So this is actually that's actually the the funny story about my life is I am <laughs> actually a third generation anthropologist. No. So your yeah. a parent and grandparent were anthropologists? My grandmother was an anthropologist um and my grandpa on that same side was a botanist. Um and then my both of my parents are anthropologists. My poor sister uh is a theoretical mathematician, so she's not an anthropologist, <laughs> but her fiance is an anthropologist. Oh my goodness! So we we ruled the roost. <laughs> so, do you look down on the yeah. theoretical mathematician, like at family gatherings? Does does she have to sit at a different oh, no, table? Never. never. I think I think <laughs> she um, sometimes. Uh, I think we both sometimes just can't explain are thinking to each other, but then sometimes it's helpful to relay if there's a concept I'm having trouble trying to explain, I can call her up and say, Hey, this is what I'm trying to say. And she says, okay, what I'm hearing is this. <laughs> and then it helps me get it better. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, well, you know what, Chris, you and I, we come from families of teachers. So it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. There's so many in my family and yours too. It's ridiculous. I think my family goes back like four or five generations of teachers, Chris, like back to like teaching in um, Poland. Like uh, that's but, that, but I guess, Neil, that's that that's kind of it's the same thing. I've talked to so many scientists and like, well, you know, my parents were a scientist and I guess it was just the thing you do. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it definitely made it a little bit difficult when I was finding my field site. Oh, because uh, I had to go somewhere in the world where nobody in my family had studied. Oh my um, goodness! <laughs> so, oh my goodness. Yeah. So Neil, I have what you what you study is so different than the guests that we normally have on our show, and I'm really excited to talk to you about 
your studies of peace. Um, cause, oh man, like I, I know all about some of the conflicts that are happening in the world very intimately because my parents took in Ukrainian refugees from the crisis. And there's a mom and a daughter that's now living with my dad. Um, and we've got to know them. And Chris, you're actually taking the mom to English lessons at like eight 30, right? Um, I'm picking, I'm picking her up from the English lessons. Right. So the whole idea of peace between nations and what the whole idea of peace is so important. Now, I don't even know where to begin to talk to you about this, Neil, but just, could you walk us through what you're studying with peace yeah. and why maybe it's important or what you're finding? Well, yeah, so that actually, for me, began with this question of what is peace and why is it important? And I originally approached it from uh, the legal side and the legislative side uh, because I, when I graduated college, I worked for a city council member in Chicago. And then when I first moved to Northern Ireland on the Fulbright, I was working for the Northern Ireland Assembly, which is also known as Stormont, which is the regional legislative body. And when, when I first moved to Belfast, um, one of the things that I had, when I studied up and had been thinking about it was everybody kept saying, you know, this is peace. So Northern Ireland had been in a political politics as religion, religion as politics conflict from 1968 until about 1998 when the Belfast Good Friday Agreement uh, peace document was, was um, created and created this new assembly. The assembly, um, and so I became really interested in that. But one of the things that I found really interesting was all, there were so many sort of narratives saying like, oh, you know, peace, we, we have peace, everything, you know, it was very, um, we have peace, this is peace. And I and I said, I said, okay, but people are still sometimes angry or hurt or, you know, people are still... Uh, struggling, uh, or okay, you have peace in this conflict, but what about you know this type of rights or that type of rights? So I became really interested in how, especially because the way the legislature runs, it's it's a system of power sharing. Hmm. So people who uh, the two largest parties from the nationalists who are people who want to unify the island of Ireland and unionists who want to keep the legal and political ties with the rest of the United Kingdom uh, have to share power and form a parliamentary government together. And I became really interested in that question of whether or not how that works and what that means for peace. Hmm. And what I found is there's also a population of people who self-identify as other, um, who, you know, don't necessarily have an opinion on whether the island of Ireland should be unified or if Northern Ireland should remain part of the UK. And what I found is that people believe that this legislature, Stormont, the assembly, is important for peace because it gets people into the room talking and trying to govern together even when that's not necessarily successful. Currently, the Stormont is not functioning. There's been, you know, a legislative every, you know, I, there's been, you know, uh, it's been dormant for a while because the two major political parties can't get along. Hmm. But at the same time, even when they can't get along, everybody is saying, no, it's important that this institution still functions because symbolically it's so important for peace. Right. This legislature has been hmm. a way for people to deal with conflict rather than it being outright violence in the streets. Now, so uh, I've Neil, I've got a quick question. Can I? Well, it maybe isn't a quick question, but um, if you didn't study what happened with Northern Ireland, um, it was like there was a lot of people. There's a lot of violence over that time. Right. I think. Was it called the Troubles? If I'm remembering yeah, my. Troubles. My high school social social studies. Okay, um, like it wasn't like some people were angry. There was there's thousands of people died in the in the back yes. and forth. Yes, thousands of people died. Um, and and again, and I think it's always important to talk about scale, especially for 
audience members from the United States and Canada where we're used to living in really large countries, you know, that go through different time zones. Mm, yeah. Northern Ireland is the size of the United States state of Connecticut. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and it has half of Connecticut's population. What? So the scale so is... think about thousands oh. of people... It's, that's actually thousands of people, you know, being harmed and, and, and tens of thousands of people who have been affected hmm. by this conflict. The scale and the localness is particularly important. And so that's why I became really interested in peace, hmm. because it wasn't just, you know, this place where, you know, my government is a five hour flight away. Right. There's a very specific feeling of localness. And I became really interested in that and how that works um, and, and whether this institution could really function as both a symbol, which I think is actually incredibly important. I think symbols are really important, but also as a legislature. Right. If if you're trying to pass laws around you know, say, for example, things that are particularly boring, right? Like infrastructure around, you know, potholes. Mm -hmm. Can former, can, can people who formerly hated each other do that, right? Because there's, so there are mm -hmm. two things going on. The first thing is, it's great that these people are now supposed to be working together as a part of peace. And that symbolism is important. But then the second aspect is all these things that aren't necessarily related to the conflict but need to be figured out and legislated for. Hmm. And so I, I'm interested in that duality and what that means for society. Hmm. You know, Neil, I'm just looking, I'm not great at geography. Like I'm, hmm. I'll be the first to admit geography is not my strong suit. Um, when I talk to our American friends, they always like, I'm from this state. And I'm like, I have, I don't know what you're talking about. Cause I'm from Canada and I didn't really study that in school. Um, I put Ireland over the cap over the map of Canada and Northern Ireland is roughly the distance from our capital in Edmonton to our house where we live, Chris. <laughs> so it's like a two hour drive and you'd be across the entire, it's just, yeah, the scale of it. Um, so what, and, and so this, this building, this, this, not this building, but this, the some symbolic government kind of like assembly, the Stormfront, um, did I get that right? Stormfront, Storm, Stormont, Stormont, I'm sorry, yeah. Stormont, um, that symbol is enough for people that have, have had time in this conflict to put aside some of their most deep seated hatred plus other things like what? What caused this conflict to to go down from the violence that like nineteen ninety eight wasn't really that far away? Yeah, yeah, and that's that's the other thing that I think is is worth noting, right? Um, before I actually answer your question, I think okay for me, I think scale is the important part that is becoming really important to my research and thinking about scale because mm -hmm. yes, nineteen ninety eight wasn't that long ago, but when we talk about how we present studies and this is in no way a you know criticism of history i think how we think about history is incredibly important but because of the linear and narrative nature of how we think about history we say okay 1998 they got peace and it sort of was a period at the end of that sentence and that's helpful for a certain type of history but for me as an anthropologist i want to sort of add layers to that and see what's happening now oh my goodness um, i think you could write a whole dissertation and people have on what really made peace possible um i think that for me i think the most important part was groups that had formally decided that violence was how they were going to exert their political positions, turning to and becoming political parties and coming together to potentially negotiate with each other. Oh, And I think, and that was beginning in the early 1990s. And so I think when groups of people and also, I mean, I don't want to give the United States, you know, always too much credit in 
in different affairs, but the Clinton administration, well, starting with the Jimmy Carter administration up until the Bill Clinton administration, Bill Clinton um, had set up a commission of three um, international arbiters, including uh, led by a U.S. Senator then uh, George Mitchell. And they came and chaired peace talks. And so it was that forum of bringing people together to talk <laughs> that really got it going. And, so it's, and again, in those um, people who are really invested in the peace and conflict studies, we'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, again, the different layers, the macro of getting groups of people together or creating referendums of do you accept this or not to the very micro everyday peace building of people who were able to access university educations for the first time. Mm. And so um, I was talking to, I have a friend who loves to tell me about the first time he as a young Protestant person met a Catholic for the first time, um, <laughs> you know, or so him being a unionist ostensibly meeting a nationalist um, or people uh, realizing, you know, this is my neighbor um, but just not, but, uh, you know, and so I think that's what made the, and when we think about peace, the, the piece that I'm sort of interested in focusing on right now, right, is a very legal type of peace, hmm. right? There, it's not, there's a, there's a sort of set of institutions and frameworks. And I would argue that there is peace. And I've talked to people who say that there is peace on a local everyday level, but there are still, you know, I, again, it, 1998 is 24 years away. So there's still a lot of stuff that needs to be worked out. Oh, yeah. And, you know, a lot of uphill challenges. Hmm. Um, that, But at the same time, you know, I mean, I don't think I think the fact that the that so many people want Stormont to get back up and running Rather than, you know, the fact that they're calling for government and not calling for guns is important. Mm -hmm. It's the power of just talking to people mm -hmm. um, like these these audio spaces that we have. It, you it's really it's really difficult to not see somebody as a person when you're talking to them rather than, you know, they're just somebody out there. And you uh, uh, with words on Twitter. But if you dis have a discussion with them, even if you don't agree, that discussion is something that diffuses a lot of anger. And um, I think that's why people are so angry on social media all the time. And they have no peace is because they're not talking to each other. They're not having discourse. They're just like shouting into the void. So I can see why maybe people f felt this is a better way, but you, it takes so much courage. If you, if you, so if your, your family had, you know, was part of the troubles in, in Northern Ireland and you lost family members to this, just turning the other cheek. Oh man, I don't, that would be so hard. Yeah. And I, I think also, I think that as new generations come in, um, it gets a little easier. And by that, I don't mean, you know, that we should forget, you know, what happened and sweep things under the rug. But mm -hmm. I think um, a lot of some of the folks I talked to who were older statesmen when I was working for the government, a lot of them would tell me about the effect of becoming grandparents hmm. um, and what that meant and for future generations. And and, you know, I would say my generation, too, of people who I'm part of the so-called Good Friday generation as they call it in northern Ireland, of people who were young kids or you know just born either around the time of the good friday agreement um or after and they have been living in a very different world <laughs> um and i think that's something that's hopeful um but you know like a lot of other places around the world northern ireland also struggles with non-troubles related crises you know all of the uk right now is having a cost of living mm -hmm. crisis just like in the united states we're having issues with inflation yeah um my not what well, i my limits of knowledge around canada's economy um <laughs> we have you know, i'm sure yeah maple syrup whew, so expensive now yeah yeah <laughs> um, <laughs> no we have inflation problems up here big time too yeah um 
So, uh, Neil, we, we probably could keep talking about this stuff for for a while. I have so many questions and you're such a wealth of knowledge. But to to keep this space moving um, and just to kind of reset the room, if you don't see our guest, Neil, we've had technical difficulties and, and Neil is calling in from Clubhouse and multi-chatting through our profile, the Bunsen and Beaker profile. So we're talking to Neil Kaplan Kelly, who's working on his PhD around peace. Um, and then after we ask him a couple more questions, we'll open up the floor to guests to maybe pick your brain if you're comfortable oh, with that, Neil. Yeah. So, all right. So, um, my other question, and this is a, uh, this is more, maybe more lighthearted one it, it, because we're a dog account. You wanted to talk a little bit about what you teach <laughs> about how dogs help anthropologists, um, out in the with your, with your line of knowledge. So could you talk to us about yeah. that? Yeah. So one of the things that I, you know, I, cause I, I listened, I was listening to some of the science pods and I try to be on when, when I can. Um, and I was thinking about, you know, how do I explain anthropology, you know, as a science, you know, and even in our initial conversations, I was saying, you know, I'm not that kind of scientist you usually have. Um, and my own love of dogs. So anthropologists primarily, at least in sociocultural realms, conduct ethnography, which is, as our main method, which is intensive participant observation. So we go to a site and we live there with people for as long as we can um, and try to fully understand what life is like in a different society and in a different culture. Hmm. And one of the ways and which can be which can be a very intensive type of training um, and a very intensive type of work. And, and one of the, the benefits of ethnography is how subjective it is. And it gives you the opportunity to reflect and learn a lot about yourself, not just about other people. And so when I teach Introduction to Cultural Anthropology, I have a special week where we talk about dogs. And there are two sort of points I want to make about how dogs are really helpful in anthropology. So the first thing is I teach a short article by an anthropologist named Kristen Goodsey, um, who talks about when she brought her basset hounds to, with her to the field. We call it going to the field <laughs> in Bulgaria. Okay. And her basset hounds had never seen sheep before. Okay. <laughs> and so at one point they got loose. Uh oh. And were ch had found some sheep and were chasing the sheep. And the farmer who owned the sheep was very upset that his sheep were being scared by these dogs. And and he and and uh, the anthropologists were arguing with each other. <laughs> and he was finally he finally said, you know, like. And, and she was trying to explain that they'd never seen sheep before. And he was saying, well, what do you mean they've never seen sheep before? They're, you know, they're dogs. They should know not to chase the sheep. And the anthropologist had to say, yes, but they're American dogs. Oh. And in, no, and in acknowledging that, you sort of learned a little bit about how, not representing all Americans or all Bulgarians, but a little bit about how she, you know, certain things she had trained her dog in certain ways about certain things and you know whereas dogs and the where she was in bulgaria had been trained in a different way about what was important not to um, chase sheep the second, yeah not to chase sheep yeah <laughs> and the second article i teach is by an anthropologist named karen lang who's um also actually worked in northern ireland um and i you know i personally um because i worked in the government i didn't do a lot of um, I didn't talk to, I wasn't sort of around the whole city of Belfast as much as Karen was. And she talked about how she, when she brought her dog over, um, you know, Belfast as a city is a beautiful place. I highly, if, if people ever, you know, want to travel, it's a great place to go. But there are still some areas where people notice that you're not from there. Okay. You know, and so somebody who's, you know, like anywhere, but so, but for Karen, she was able to access certain spaces and become part of the community because she would walk her dog oh. around, you know, and because she, you know, 
it wasn't that she was there. She it was she was clearly you know not necessarily tourist, not necessarily journalist, not necessarily somebody who was you know looking for a, a deep story. She was just a woman who was new to the area with a dog. It definitely made it easier for her to build connections and community. And that's something that in my own research, you know, I unfortunately do not have a dog, um, even though I thought getting one to help my ethnography would be helpful. But, you know, I just, I, the quarantine rules were too much. Um, <laughs> but I, um, I found that one of the things about when you're working intensively with people and trying really hard, you know, it's a very intimate type of research. You know, ethnography, you really are trying to get people to not just trust you, but really invite you into their world. Mm -hmm. You know, I, it's very much like being in kindergarten again and walking up to somebody and saying, hi, I'm new. Will you be my friend? <laughs> and one of the take ways take me into your house and cook me your foods and show me yeah, around. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the things that you, I at least sort of found was that is when people can start having inside jokes with you and making fun of you, you know, you sort of belong, you know, lighthearted <laughs> fun. And I found very quickly that one of the things that got me clearly, you know, accepted by some of the people I was working with was they really enjoyed making fun of the fact that I really love dogs and I would be actively trying to pet every dog or meet every dog, you know, and just <laughs> do that. And, and, you know, sort of learning that it was like not necessarily, you know, socially normal to say, oh, who's a cute puppy? You know, how are you? <laughs> Was, was a very important lesson and really, I think, helped solidify some of the relationships that I'd been been building. Um. So I just I, I just I'm putting two and two together, because if you're going to go study someplace somewhere, people you want people to act authentically around you. Otherwise, you're not getting authentic observations as an anthropologist. Am I on the right track? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. You know. A, a dog is like a secret it's like a secret weapon against people as long as you're going to a place that likes dogs too um it's a secret weapon to get you around and have people trust you a bit more hmm yeah i mean depending on certain spaces you know i mean i because again because i worked in government you know it it was i think bringing you know a dog to to the legislature chamber <laughs> wouldn't have gotten me very far no <laughs> but um but you know other things did you know of of having some irish ancestry but unfortunately not having the immigration records hmm. helped in certain ways whereas you know i have colleagues who in anthropology who work in other fields who find um that you know their love of video games or something so like we you know finding and it goes back to a lot of the peace questions too of finding sort of moments of commonality with other people as a way of building relationships mm -hmm. uh, that's important. Yeah. It's as much as you may disagree with somebody about whatever they have, whatever they think about the world. Um, as long as it's not like, you know, violent and awful and racist, whatever, like they just maybe have some kind of different political vision than you. Um, if you both love dogs and treat dogs with respect and love, it really changes how you, you view that person because you have such a strong bond in that same commonality that is so big and part of your own personal, um, like your own personal belief set. So I, I see that. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, so you're saying, you know, this, uh, this legislative body that helped with peace in Northern Ireland, um, uh, Stormont, we could also just, you know, inundate p angry people with dogs right? and then have them walk dogs together. That could possibly be a, po a thing. Possibly. I think, though, I, I will <laughs> say, though, unfortunately, in places that are have long histories of violence. I, I mean, again, I'm not I'm not that type of scientist who is good at statistical data, but I have noticed um, just anecdotally that there was definitely a very different type of fear of dogs oh. um, in some of the. Oh, uh, really intensely conflict. So, I, yeah, but like, yeah, so I, I mean, yes, definitely. But I also think that, you know, there have also been a lot of really good studies out of psycho psychology and trauma informed studies about dogs helping mm -hmm. with the healing process. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, again, as an anthropologist, you always have to be kind of 
you always have to sort of be second guessing all the time because there are things that may feel totally like normal to me of like, of course, you know, um, you know, I, I remember getting into a debate with somebody about whether or not a sandwich counted as a snack or a meal, you know, so of course <laughs> it's a meal, but maybe for somebody else, it's just a snack, you know, and, and that's, you know, and so that sort of constantly like having to sort of realize that things that feel so true to you may not be true to somebody else um, is there. Well, it also depends what's on the sandwich. You could, you know, if you have yeah. like a, you know, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, maybe you could classify that as dessert. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we shouldn't get into a big sandwich debate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Neil, are you okay taking some questions? I don't want to be, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I don't want to be too far over the top of the hour, even though we had some tech difficulties yeah. at the start. Um, now, Chris, I think, are you still around to help? Or are you off driving to, um, I don't know if you're here in person. I am still here in person. Okay. So if you have some questions uh, uh, to Neil, and remember, if you're just joining and you're like, where's Neil? Who's Neil? Neil's on Clubhouse. We had technical difficulties on Spaces. So he's talking through our profile from my multicast on Clubhouse. Um, Neil is an anthropologist that studies peace building and, and what causes peace and why is there peace? Um, so if you have some questions about that, it's a very different type of space tonight. Um, we'd love for you to ask, uh, ask Neil and then, um, yeah, so, uh, Chris is bringing some people up and just some ground rules. Um, you may not get up to the stage if we don't recognize your account. Um, and, uh, and as well, if you have a locked account, it's tough to bring you up because it's hard to fact check you. I believe random and true. Um, you have been waiting the longest. Did you have a question? Hi, Jason and Chris. This is Nancy. Oh, hi, Meyer. Nancy. Um, this is my stealth account. Hey, Neil, um, the, pres the prime minister of Northern Ireland famously has a Burmese mountain dog, right? I mean, that's one of his signature things, which is kind uh, of curious. That, yeah, that is the president of the Republic of Ireland. Uh, oh, the Canadian. Republic yes, of Ireland. I'm sorry. Too. Yeah. No, yeah, no, no. I thought that that's kind of funny. Um, my, my question for you is, um, what are the common elements for creating this common ground to striving for peace so uh, i mean i'm interested in some of your papers and, and how do you identify those common elements and how would you go about you know finding that common project that people can mm. come together on yeah so i i i'm thinking about that i think um for a lot for at least in the legislative realm i think the first thing is that elected officials want to do the job that their constituents elected them to do, right? They want to lead. And I think that starts it for the first part. I think other major commonalities is people like, people do not like dysfunction, you know, so they want government to work. They may have different opinions about what it means for government to work, but they have all committed to being part of government. I think on more everyday levels, um, I think people want, they when we talk about um, what it means to feel safe, uh, people care about. Again, a lot of the questions could be, well, what does that mean for you? What it means to feel safe might be different for other people, or what it means for your children to have a good education might be difficult. But it's sometimes even just getting to that it feels basic and obvious, but actually very significant of, you know, I want my child to have a better life than I did. And that may look differently for different people, but if we can agree from that outset at that base statement, that actually starts. Because then you can get into the question of, well, how is your vision different than mine? And that can begin to solve problems as opposed to starting with the differences, um, it's sort of a reverse triangle in that sense. Yeah, that's good. Thanks. That's good. Good starting point. Good, good research. Good work. Thank you. I just find this so fascinating, Neil. Like it's not something I think about every day. I'm, uh, you know, I'm in the clouds with science and it's just like this whole other area of like science anthropology exists and you're doing all this work out there. Um, I just can't get enough of the knowledge. It's so cool. So Nancy, great question. 
We have a question from Clubhouse. Uh, Gia, did you have a question? Gia's on Clubhouse and also on Twitter Spaces. So have you, you've been cloned, Gia? I don't know. I don't know if Gia can speak from Clubhouse. Okay, so we'll let Gia figure out uh, the tech there. Uh, Tracy, did you have a question? Um, oh, hi. Yeah, go ahead, Tracy. Okay. Um, I did the panic thing of hitting the button a thousand times. <laughs> um, so um, I really just thought this was interesting because I was a history major in school, in college, and I did study in Northern Ireland. Oh, um, cool. So I like, I'm kind of like view it from a different point of like, well, this stuff goes like way back farther than the troubles and all this. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, we could, we could but, go all uh, the way back to the 1100s if you, if you, re if we really want to get technical. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and even like, even like, um, like with the queen's death and how people have been reacting to it, I'm like, like you get taught in school about the potato famine, like that it was just the blight and it was really like England exporting the potatoes out of Ireland. Um, so there was like a lot more to it. So I could kind of like see from a standpoint that people would still be angry. Um, but also that it is a good thing that the Good Friday Agreement happened and that they're they're trying to get some peace in there. But, um, so I don't know. I just, I just thought it was an interesting trivializing, trivializing any of that, that anger. Cause I do think it's real and it's generations of it, um, as well. And, and that's something that I've always had to be very conscious of in my work too, of, of knowing that this is deeply, deeply personal for people and it's not my society. It's not my culture. And I may never fully what these people have experienced. Sorry, Tracy, I just I'm muted sorry. your mic I, there. Uh, I cut you off there. I apologize. Tracy, did you have a follow up there? I just I just turned your mic off. There was like some water running or something. Sorry about that. Oh, yeah. Um, like I'm not religious or anything, but, you know, once I learned about the actual history, um, that's what I, you know, but um but I do think anthropology is really interesting. And I just thought this was really cool that you were talking about that today. Yeah. We're super lucky to have Neil yeah. tonight. Yeah. I'm just a long time, long time Bunsen and Beaker and Ginger fan. And so, <laughs> you know, the fact that Bunsen and Beaker might know that I exist in the world is just so, so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're so lucky to have you talk about this tonight, Neil. Um, CC, did you have a question? Um, yeah, thanks so much, um, everybody, for this really fascinating space. Um, Neil, so I know that you're still working on your PhD and all of that, but um, I was wondering if you had any sense for um, sort of further implications for your research on um, the politics and anthropology of peace. And so, because um, I was like Jason alluded to, um, so many areas in the world need peace. And so I was just curious about um, what you might hope uh, your research could do in the future. Yeah. Oh, thank you for that question. Yeah, definitely. Um, part of my dissertation is taking um, a little bit of a comparative approach uh, to the United States Congress. Um, I also, there's a whole very long set of really good literature on um the relationships between Northern Ireland and South Africa and Israel, Palestine, and um, most recently Colombia as well. Um, and so for, so for me, I, you know, I love anthropology. I love teaching um, as well. And so I hope to, I'm currently on the academic job market. Um, and so hopefully I can continue that. And I'm hope what I sort of see as one of my contributions for this is also helping teach students how to research conflict um, in, uh, in ethnographic ways and developing the types of questions. And, and because I think uh, right now, a lot of peace and conflict studies, um, rightfully so, is rooted in a lot of history, a lot of political science. Those disciplines have made 
really enormous, really important contributions, but they sometimes aren't as on the ground as anthropology can be. And so I want to really start those dialogues. But to do that, you know, especially in a lot of sensitive areas, I've been so lucky that I've had fantastic teachers who have taught me how to practice the craft of ethnography and practice the craft of anthropology. And I'm not saying I'm the best at it, um, but I hope to continue with that, that teaching of just even how do we begin to ask the question of what is peace and what does that mean for you? So yeah, I think that there's a lot of areas this could go. Again, one of the limits of my my field is that it is very subjective to a certain time and certain people. And, you know, somebody could jump on right now and say, hey, that's not my experience and you're wrong. And that's also totally okay. Um, So I I do think that there's – I would hope that, you know, when we talk about science, we talk a lot about replication and, you know, how do you do that? I would hope that just even beginning to think about how to ask these questions could be replicated going further. That's really amazing, and um, I wish you all the best the academic job market. Um, Thank yeah. you. Yeah, it's a little stressful. <laughs> yeah, I feel you. I'm an academic librarian. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so I much. I am. I am international. If any Canadian university folks are on, you know, I, 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 Canada has a very interesting parliamentary system that I would look forward <laughs> to doing some some ethnography in as well. Ooh, it's a bit of a culture shock. Um, Chris, did you ever, you taught social studies, right? Back in the day? Uh, Back in the day, it's been a while. Yeah. Did you ever show your kids like how unruly the Canadian uh, federal parliament is? Uh, Yeah. And then sometimes they, like they're banging on the table and then sometimes they're sleeping. So yeah, I showed them definitely (laughs) that. Definitely, I showed them that. Yeah, it's a bit of a shock for people that aren't Canadian to see how our politicians act because they're like, oh, Canadians are so nice. And then you look at our <laughs> politicians and they're like, somebody's trying to talk and everybody's like, and they're just like shouting and banging and making like gorilla sounds. And like, it's just outrageous. Um, well, even to even true, Jason, like they have to be witty and they have to be sharp. Yes. And they have to have like a, a quick tongue. Um, because they basically it's put down. <laughs> yes, it's like who has be the best put down? put down? I know. And put in your place. Yeah, it's probably why Canada Canada produces comedians. Um, is our parliament system is that we just have to deal with that. Um, so there you go. There's a little bit of uh, there's some little bit of insight into our government there, Neil. Excellent. <laughs> they're they they're very poorly behaved. Um, Stephen, did you have a question? It's good to see you. Sersha and Goramila Mahagut for coming. So we, you've got, um, in Ireland, you've got the, um, you know, the PLO, we've got people that want Ireland to remain independent and others that say, nah, let's, uh, let's go ahead and join, uh, that crew over there. And then you've got the, uh, Catholics versus Protestants. So I, I'm curious as to the, uh, dependent variables you went into study, uh, you know, where, where, where was your focus and what was the, um, what was the whole sample space that you, uh, you came away with? Uh, not, not to mention a little hat tip to Bobby Sands who documented both sides on toilet paper in prison. Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, I was able to interview, um, over 50, uh, elected representatives across the country and, uh, the region, I'm sorry. And, um, varying levels. I was able really to, um, uh, talk to people from across the political spectrum. Um, a lot of, it's one of those things where, um, it, the complexity of these things where so there's an assumption that all Protestants are unionists, right? So people who want to remain with the the United Kingdom, you know, unionist UK, and then that all quote unquote Catholics are nationalists or Republicans or Republic, you know, wanting to be part of the Republic of Ireland. Um, but, you know, increasingly it's less about religion. You know, I know Catholic Unionists and I know Protestant nationalists, um, but because of how the conflict began, again, oversimplifying a lot of history here, um, 
it's been really easy to boil it down to Catholic versus Protestants, which is why I prefer unionist versus nationalist, um, because it sort of uh, gives a different level. Um, but I primarily, um, again, one of the the hardest parts of ethnography, too, is finding people who will talk to you. So I was very lucky that um, people were actively interested in talking to me and then um, would introduce me to other people. But I did primarily spend um, a lot of time with uh, the Social Democratic and Labor Party, which is a moderate nationalist party. Um, and some of um, I was able to go to party conferences for the Alliance Party, which is a, a quote unquote other party, um, talk to the Green Party. Uh, and I have was unable because of uh, of COVID to go to the Ulster Unionist Party conference, um, but I was lucky to have uh, interlocutors from almost every political party who was interested in talking to me um, about things, which is which can be which again access can be very difficult um, in in the field. So I was really lucky for that. And yeah, I think there's a lot of um, you know one of the pro the hardest things about studying places in violence is sometimes in, again, I'm not an archeologist, but I have a lot of respect for my colleagues who um, go through and have to find the literal material of history um, that have to be in there and how people, um, you know, write down their stories and, and engage their, their lives um, is definitely something that uh, becomes a challenge. Um, Again, because it is such an intimate practice um, at times. I think it's a, a huge and ambitious undertaking uh, right out of the gate. Now, look, on the fun side, did you catch any uh, Clannad or any of the Brendan family in concert like Enya? Yes, I did actually. Oh. I did actually. It was my, the treat for when my, my parents... Uh, came to visit me when I first moved to Belfast and my sister had been studying abroad in Scotland. And um, so uh, Clannard, uh, uh, some of the members were coming to Belfast. And so I, I remember I, I um, s stood in line to get some tickets and we all went and it was, it was very nice. And um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really, um, I also spent a lot of time. I really, I, I do enjoy watching sports. I'm not athletic, but I watch the sports. So I would um, go to different sporting events too uh, throughout. And, the, you know, it just as, as ways of connecting with the community and for fun. And that's awesome. Thank you so much. I mean, uh, Goromai. So what does that, what does that mean? What did you and Steven say? Uh, so that means it's thank you um, in in uh, in Irish. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. I love it. It is the only Irish I know, unfortunately. So. <laughs> but if you, if you know any words, thank you is a good one. So do do people in Ireland speak Irish or is that like a faded thing? I don't know anything about it. That, like I don't. Uh, there are people who do. Um there are also uh, called Geltox, uh, which are areas where Irish is only spoken. There's um, really? some in West Belfast in Northern Ireland, I think a small pocket in the city of Derry and Londonderry. Uh, but then in the Republic as well, there are some. But uh, English is the common mm -hmm. language and state language. Um, but, and this was actually, again, when we talk about things that are important for peace building, um, most recently, the Northern Ireland Assembly has set up ways of translating so that people can speak in their preferred language. Oh, that's cool. Irish or the language of Ulster Scots, um, which is a language that comes out of Scotland that s some unionists also speak. And so they may um, have continuous translation um, hmm. as they're speaking, which is because um, originally the law had been that anything said in Irish had to be then repeated and translated into English. Um, but now they have um, a synchronous translation. Um, and similarly, same thing for, for 
uh, sign language as well. So that, you know, again, these, it, it's, it's sometimes it's a small thing, like being able to speak your preferred language and being able to have that language translated that really gets people to come together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, but it's not necessarily a small thing. I was talking to a scientist on my podcast. I think she's a guest on SciChat coming up here in in October. Um, about the sign language thing, like it's a it's something that at at teachers conventions, for example, when I present, I present at teachers convention. I never thought, and very few teachers probably do that. We should have a sign sign language person while we're presenting because I, you exclude, you exclude people. They can come and they can enjoy and maybe read lips, but it's not the same thing as having the language spoken to them in the way that they understand it. So I can see why that would bring people together with different spoken languages too. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I think it just makes it a little bit more accessible. And, and I think sometimes also the act of showing that you're, you're trying, Mm -hmm. you know, um, is the important is also one of the important bits of I'm trying to understand um, mm-hmm. is the key part. Hmm. I'm just reflecting. So that's uh, pretty deep what you just said there, Neil. <laughs> it's the act of trying. If we just try, if, if we know, just if have to try, we have to talk and try. You could, yeah. If you could just understand why moose legs are so important <laughs> to Bunsen. You know, we call it a food taboo in anthropology. And if Bunsen could just understand <laughs> why it's a food taboo for you, you know, it, the world would be a, just a, a, a much more harmonious place. Um, <laughs> though I, li- I, I, I enjoy the moose leg hunts. So. Oh, I do not. Gross. Yes. Um, yeah. And that's, that's uh, just from the general study of anthropology bringing up um food taboos i bet you could what are is uh, without getting into the weeds but what are some food taboos that you know around the world oh around the world well i think well the biggest one um you know and 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 is uh what uh the great anthropologist uh marshall solins uh who really wrote a lot about the categories and how we make them. He made the important point that a major food taboo um, in many Western cultures and not in others is, is dogs. Oh you know? yes. Um, and, and other sort of what could be considered household pets, the same way that we could turn it around as to who we consider kin and kinship too. you know, for me, my pets are like family, mm-hmm. but in other cultures they may not be. Um, I think Uh, one for me that I, you know, I personally, um, the, one of the, besides this is a sandwich, a snack or not. One of the big culture (laughs) shots I had in Belfast was that donuts are not a breakfast food. Um, cause I brought in some donuts to work on one of my first days and I was trying to hand them out at nine in the morning until finally said, and everybody kept rejecting me until finally they said, Oh no, I'll have one this afternoon with my cup of tea. And I said, why you don't eat donuts in the afternoon? And then it became um, a, a, a question, um, and so uh, so that was you know again it's 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 sometimes little things like that. Um, <laughs> Were they like who's this weirdo bringing donuts in the morning? Yeah, they, 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 I think they sort of knew that I was eager and you know was trying to to do things, but it was definitely just sort of a like because again it's it's things that you don't really notice are are different or yeah. important until you till you meet them. Oh man, um, we have Tim I, Hortons in Canada, Neil. That's like our nationalist Canadian donut chain and that's a thing that you a, you like you bring donuts in the morning Hortons. for Oh sorry, go ahead. There's a Tim Hortons right outside of Belfast City Hall. Um, and it's the only one in Northern Ireland. And I know because I know a lot of people like to go to it. It is so yeah. <laughs> Tim Hortons donuts. Oh, yeah, donuts the- in the morning was a, that was one that like, you know, just sometimes you just try so hard to understand other people, but you just, <laughs> I could just never understand. <laughs> you just create some, some like uh, instant faux pas and you're just trying to give people like sugary carbohydrates. So, like, please. Yeah. And they're like, no, not now. What's the matter with you? Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> um, Steven, did you have a comment? I'm sorry. I saw your hand up there. Okay. So this will be my last question. Unless I think of something else. Is the Guinness Stout in Ireland really 
any better than other places around the world? Ooh. Well, um, I would say yes. No, I, I, it's blasphemy to say, but I am actually, I'm not a big fan of dark beer. I prefer <laughs> a cider uh, if I am going to, to drink just because Guinness is so heavy. Um, but it definitely, I've had it in different places. And I think the way that people are properly trained to pour it, because it is supposed to be poured in a specific way, um, the fact that that's sort of the norm makes it more consistent and tastes better than in places where folks may not know how to pour it specifically because you actually do have to let it rest um, and only <laughs> do certain things at certain angles. Um, so it, it, I think it's only like in beer the, physics. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. Sorry, go only, ahead. <laughs> only in the training. Um, but, you know, I think I – I think that if if the right the right person was pouring it here, it would be similar. But you know, I think also just atmosphere helps too, <laughs> um, both cultural and and uh, ozone. It's <laughs> <laughs> a great question, Stephen. <laughs> well, it's like poutine in Canada. Um, there's poutine, which you get from Quebec, and it is so people say way better than the poutine that you'd eat from Costco in Alberta. Um, so it, it kind of like, they just know how to make it where it's from, I guess. It's I don't, the squeaky cheese. Yes. I know you keep bringing it up that it's the squeak. Did you have poutine or poutine in when you were in Quebec, Chris? No, because I'm a vegetarian. I know you can't have the gravy, right? Did, right. but Adam did. No. Did Adam go to Quebec? Adam, of course did. Yes. Adam went to Quebec. No. Right. No, Duncan did. Duncan did. And did they, 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 everybody raves about the poutine in Quebec. Uh, 100%. And yeah. you have to keep in mind that we have Quebecois who live among us here. Oh, yeah. um, and they <laughs> teach at your school and they teach with me. Yeah. So um, they are very <laughs> yeah, much aware. They look the down their nose at the, the poutine that we have in Alberta. I, yeah. Um, Sylvie, the French immersion science, t- science teacher. She's like, no, that's not Putin. I'm like, okay, Sylvie. Anyways. <laughs> I mean, I get, we, we could even get into the whole, having grown up in upstate New York, growing up in apple picking country, maple syrup country, and also cheese curd country. You know, I, I <laughs> feel the influences, but have, have not, I, that's on my list of things of, is doing some Canada things, if only for some Putin, Putin. Um, Comparisons. Tasting. You have to come up here for our ketchup chips. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, they're so true. good. They make a spicy ketchup chip now. Oh. Oh, it's so good. Yeah, that was that was something where, you know, I mean, it, it's not you, I I like to bring sort of gifts for my interlocutors and and a lot of things that people really enjoyed that I would bring back for them were uh, Reese's peanut butter cups and flaming hot Cheetos. <laughs> yeah. Things that people would consistently ask me for. Um and craft macaroni and cheese craft dinner. Um were definitely the three sort of things that I get. And again, it, there were definitely, especially when I was living in Belfast long term, there would be times when, you know, I'm not, I don't even particularly like Cheetos, but I really <laughs> need a Cheeto right now. <laughs> like I just miss something that reminds me of home. Oh. Um, even when I'm in a culture that may on um, paper does not look actually that different from where I currently live. <laughs> That's a good point. Home is where the Cheetos are. Is that a good thing to wrap up with? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, I think we're out of speak. We're out of people asking questions. So Neil, I think we'll do a wrap up here. Um, now we had trouble getting Neil up on um, Twitter Spaces, so I'm just going to go to your profile and throw one of your tweets up in the nest. That way, people can follow you on Twitter. Okay. Um, I'll try and find one here. Um, da, 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 da. um, found this gem while hanging out with my cousin. Is that appropriate? Yes, that's fine. Yes, that is my, that is my, uh, you can tell I'm a child of an academic, um, in that as a child, I misbehaved <laughs> and, uh, cut a shade, um, that I had drawn on. And I still believe that logically there should be more shade extra for emergencies, uh, and my father, rather than, you know, punishing me like a normal parent, uh, made me write a book and sell them <laughs> to people I knew to get uh, to get uh, uh, money to work in shade. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. 
He's like, you better get this. Uh, you better get turn this into an ebook and get that on Amazon. You got to pay back. Well, for he this. also typed. He he was the co-author who typed it up too. So you oh know. <laughs> you know, you are a child of an academic win. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, so I threw a tweet of Neil's up in the nest. So if you want to follow Neil here on Twitter, that would be awesome. Um, anything, anything else you'd like me to announce on your end, Neil? Anything coming up that you'd like to? Like you'd get the um, shout out or before we move into our own wrap up? No, not, not that, but I'm, I'm, I'm always happy to talk to folks and I'm, I thank you again for having me and uh, sorry about the technical difficulties, but um, just cause it's on the air, I would request that every dog and or cat that likes them get a belly rub in okay. my honor uh, tonight. Aww. I think that's important. As soon as we're done talking, Bunsen and Beaker getting big hugs. So um, our partner Indra is here in the space and I, I put up one of her tweets about her upcoming space daily gratitude dose. Um, Indra is our awesome partner with uh, wellness and mindfulness and meditation. It's stuff that I don't know anything about. So I can do the science angle. I can do the dog angle. And we're just really lucky that we have Indra on at like with us that we can help kind of promote her stuff to our followers because Everything's stressful sometimes. Um, we all need breaks in our day. And um, so if you want a little bit of a mental boost, her spaces are excellent for that. The guests she had on yesterday had some really good tips for even me about maybe I shouldn't be working 23 hours out of 24 hours in a day. So that was great. <laughs> um, so that's up in the nest if you want to join that. Um, the other thing up in the nest that's buried a bit is uh, if you haven't picked up, the text from Bunsen ebook, it is out. It's our pinned tweet on our profile. Chris and I worked really hard all summer to get that ebook out, and it's chock full of fun text from Bunsen. Um, our patrons are moving over from Patreon to the Paw Pack Plus. So that will be open to the general public in a week or so. Um, we, Chris and I also worked really hard on that all summer. It's got lots of stuff. It's like Patreon um, on steroids. Uh, so as we as we wrap up. Neil, thank you so much for being our guest tonight. Thank you so much for being... Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, this was awesome. It, you know, it's so good to talk about things that are not necessarily super, super science-y related, like, hey, let's look at, you know, calculate the physics of the stars. Sometimes we need to calculate the physics of the people that live right beside us and find common ground and talk. Um, so, Neil, thanks for, thanks for talking about peace with us today. So uh, also thank you to the speakers and everybody who listened tonight, despite our technical difficulties. I really appreciate you sticking with us. Um, and even though most of the comments is in the chat, uh, people saying, no, we can't see Neil. No, we can't hear Neil. <laughs> thank you for thank you for the people that posted in the chat. Um, I'll go through there and check. But I most of the comments in the chat are like, we can't hear Neil. We can't see Neil. So we're so glad Neil was able to join from um, join from Clubhouse. We have Pet Chat on Saturday, and we have a special guest. We are highlighting a pet account every month, and our guest on Saturday is um, Kuno, the service Roddy. Kuno is a service dog that helps his um, differently abled mom get around and do various activities. Kuno has a really cool account on Twitter, a really big TikTok account, and um, Kuno's mom talks about accessibility. So when you can't move the same as somebody with two legs um how does that affect how you explore your city so we're going to get into that and how kuno helps her and next tuesday on science chat we have dr oni pagan and dr pagan has written a bunch of books and one of his books is called um drunk flies and stoned dolphins it's all about how the animal kingdom yeah, that's what it's called, Drunk Flies and Stone Dolphins. It's about how the animal kingdom finds its own drugs and maybe how we can learn what they do versus the drugs that humans sometimes get unfortunately addicted to. Um, he also has other really cool books about planarian worms, and I love planarian worms. I think most scientists love planarian worms, so check out that next Tuesday. Anything to add, Chris, or are you gone? I don't know if you're even here. You're probably driving. Well, we'll 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 close out the space. Um, one more time, Neil. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Have a good rest of your evening. Okay. Take care, everybody.
for science, empathy, and cuteness. Be kind, and we'll see you on Saturday for Pet Chat. Bye-bye. Okay, I closed the space on uh, Twitter. Neil, thank you so much for jumping over here to Clubhouse. That worked great. Yeah, thank you. Um, And yeah, I will just uh, head out now, I think. I will leave quietly, as they say. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, I'm just going to quit uh, Clubhouse. So take care. Uh, Thanks. This was so cool. Yeah, what a a cool topic. Thank you for giving up your time tonight. Yeah. Well, thank you. And uh, I will uh, hopefully see you at another one of these soon. You betcha. Okay, take care, man. Bye-bye.